A few years ago, there was a writer who wrote on the subject, A Good Man Project. And um, they listed some of the qualities of a good man, um, such as a good man is loyal to his people, a man of his word, protects his loved ones, he treats everyone with respect. And of course, they went on down. You could have your own list, and uh, but um, those were some that they mentioned. Um, I like the story that I heard years ago about the widow woman who visited the church for the very first time on Wednesday night in an evening service, and the music director said, we're going to allow that our, allow our visitor, our guest, to select the first hymn tonight. Well, she looked around a little bit and finally selected and pointed to one of the widowers in the church. So some of y'all will get that later, okay? I... <laughs> If you could see the look on people's faces, they're like, I didn't get that. <laughs> a hymn, a man, a hymn, okay. I heard someone say the other day, why are good men like parking spaces? Have you heard that? It said because uh, the good ones are already taken, you know. So, well, it's getting worse and worse. Sometime back, the Mar Marines came up with that great slogan, and I liked it. The Marines are looking for a few good men. And it really stuck. It was good. And uh, certainly they are. Well, in our scripture today, it tells us about a good man. Uh, verse 1, it says, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. These words are a letter of commendation to a, uh, are from a Christian pastor to a uh, commendable Christian man. And uh, whenever John thought about Gaius, um, I would tell you that his heart welled up with love in thinking about this man. You can see it as he writes uh, to him uh, here. Verses 2 through 4, John commends Gaius um, for his life of integrity. And I love what he says here in the scripture, and that is his strong stand for the truth. Um, that's what John thinks of when he thinks of this man. Then on verses 5 through 8, John is commending this good man, a Christian layman in the church. He's commending him for his generosity. Here's a man who is very generous. He's known for his hospitality because he had opened up his home to missionaries and he was very generous with them. Gaius was doing what he thought that Jesus would do. Certainly the same thing that we ought to do, whatever we believe that Jesus would do, that's what we want to do. And that was Gaius here. And uh, uh, the, the life of Gaius, I would tell you, is, is a, a great example uh, for our modern day and time for believers today to be generous to those who are taking the gospel to other people. He's the great example for this. The, the commentary writer, Kent Hughes, I like what he said. He said, there is no such thing as a Christian Scrooge. We may know some Scrooges who claim to be Christians, but I don't think you can claim to really know Christ and be a stingy person. And you know what? I think he's absolutely right. I'll make the statement today, our opening statement here, one of the greatest joys in life is investing eternally by becoming co-laborers or co-partners together with missionaries and taking the gospel message to the world. That's the greatest investment that you can ever make. We've heard from the Nelsons uh, that um, and how much they appreciate our financial support as uh, they have been in Australia for a number of years now. As you know, we were with them this past uh, August and, and saw the great ministry is taking place and realizing because people uh, like you gave here in our ministry that uh, they're able to do ministry there in Australia. Today, we saw on the video here, uh, and we would have heard from the Adams had it not been for our situation today, but we're praying for them. But we've heard the need of the Adams. They're, they have not been to Wales yet to serve. They've gone there on uh, uh, different trips but they are raising their support so they can go and help the ministry there of Richie Oric and then eventually uh, start other churches. Now I want us to look at this Christian layman here. This is what we're dealing with today. We're, we're giving a challenge to our church to give to missions this coming year so we can send these missionaries forth. 
And I want you to look at what this layman did when he saw the need. First of all, Gaius persisted all for his name. Verse two, verse three and four. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. Just as you walk in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Now, many believe that maybe John was the one who won Gaius to the Lord. And John was writing a letter to Gaius here and telling him that he had heard many wonderful things uh, uh, about his life and how that he was walking with the Lord. And I would say to you today that one of the most exciting things that you can ever witness in life is to see a person come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, see their life change, and then they go on to live a life of integrity, walking in truth. That's what Gaius says here. He's walking in truth. Uh, so, and I would tell you that's what the gospel is all about. That's why we want to get the gospel to the world. And missions is getting the gospel to the world. One Sunday morning years ago on a mission trip that I had taken down to uh, uh, Argentina, I preached in a little church there that we had to get out of the car. We drove outside of Buenos Aires, which is a big modern city. We drove outside of the city to a very poor community. And... Um, roads, uh, a lot of the roads were dirt roads, and uh, we had to get out of the car about two blocks out because the road, it had rained so much the roads were flooded. And so we, we walked in the water to church that day, and when I got there, um, there, I met a man there by the name of Willie. Willie had been witnessed to for 17 years by our veteran missionary there, and yet he never received Christ. His daughter had accepted the Lord and she began praying for dad and uh, witnessing to her father. And And uh, the problem of it was uh, he every weekend Willie was drunk. He was a great soccer player. In fact, they told me that Willie could have played in the pros. He was so good. But uh, but because of his drinking, is uh, he's an alcoholic and, uh, you know, uh, they could not uh, have him playing in the pros and... Uh, but every weekend he's drunk, he's out there playing on soccer. And, um, but after hearing the gospel witness uh, so many times, finally one day he came to church. And uh, that Sunday happened to be a, um, a rookie missionary there for the first time. Uh, he finally got on the field, didn't know the language. Uh, uh, the veteran missionary is translating for him. And uh, so uh, while he's preaching, Willie had been drinking stood up in the service and caused a commotion in the service. And, of course, the young missionary didn't know what to do, and so the veteran missionary told him, just keep on preaching. And the daughter and mother pleaded with him to, to sit down, be quiet, and finally Willie just stormed out and he left. Well, one of the national young national pastors went out there that week and um, witnessed once again to Willie, and thank God... After 17 years, Willie accepted Jesus as his Savior. He got saved. Thank the Lord for that. In the very next service, testimonies were given, uh, asked for, and Willie was the very first one that stood up and gave his testimony of what God had done for him. Well, several months passed, and his daughter told our missionary, and uh, that's how I knew the story. Of course, I got to meet Willie firsthand while there. But the daughter months later said, I've seen my father sober on the we on the weekends for the very first time. And it was around Christmas time. And she said, I've never seen my father sober at Christmas time. And this is the first time I've ever seen him not drinking at Christmas time. And she said, besides that, he's now telling me how that a young Christian girl ought to act. And uh, now that he knows the Lord. But you know what I preached that Sunday? I took my shoes and socks off, rolled my pants leg up, and um, walking away out there in that water, going back to our car where we had left it, and I looked back at the building there, and Willie's the only one left. He's there. He stayed behind to turn off the lights, the few little primitive lights that they had, locked the doors up, because... 
someone persisted in giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. All for his name. Thank God for willies that come to know Christ because of missionaries that went. Our church sent that missionary and Willie got saved. Several repeated uh, people reported to John about this man's good works. And I wonder what others say about us when they speak of our lives. I wonder what others say of us. Second of all, which is he Gaius participated all for his name. Look with me in verse 5. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you, you will do well because they went forth for his namesake, take, taking nothing from the Gentiles. I didn't put anything in my sermon about taking nothing from the Gentiles, but it's just basically saying there, you don't take from the lost world. It's quite disturbing to me when I look of those that say they want to do their ministry and taking from the lost world. It shouldn't be that way. It ought to be God's people that are giving and uh, supporting. Um, but I want you to see how generous this man was. Apparently, Gaius had been helping some men who were traveling preachers. Um, they were they were taking the gospel to others. And when these missionaries, these traveling preachers, we're going to call missionaries, they were traveling f- through, they had no Hampton Inn to stop at and to rest. They had no Chick-fil-A to stop uh, into and be able to uh, get a good chicken sandwich. Uh, no food there. And so Gaius opened up his home and he began showing these men hospitality. They had a place to stay. They had a place to eat. And there were there were some leaders... If you look at the story, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there were some of the leaders who were condemning and criticizing him for helping these traveling uh, preachers or missionaries. And, uh, you know, I would tell you, hear me today, it takes a special kind of person who can weather disappointments and disagreements and disharmony of others in order to just keep on doing God's work. You know, a good work uh, a lot of times will be opposed by others. Certainly Satan will oppose it. He won't like it. And he will do everything he can to stop it. But uh, it didn't stop Gaius from doing a good work. Why was Gaius giving to these men? Why was he giving even though he is criticized by others for, for giving? Gaius did it because... The Bible says these missionaries were doing doing this for his name's sake. They were going forth. They were traveling around. They're giving the gospel for his name's sake. They're going. They're, they're doing it for Jesus. And so Gaius wanted to be a part of that. Gaius had resources, but he didn't hoard them in a selfish way, much like what a lot of people may do today. He used them to help others, to help missionaries who were taking the gospel to other regions for his name's sake. And when you believe in something, my friend, I believe that you're willing to sacrifice. Is that not true? I, I, I think that you would agree with me today. When you truly believe in something, you're willing to sacrifice whatever it might be. Maybe sacrifice all. Our mission conference that we've had over the last couple of weeks is so our church can see the missionaries, uh, the Michael Nelson family, they were willing to go and to sacrifice for his namesake to Australia. Uh, The Adams, the missionaries, the Adams, they're now willing to sacrifice and go for his namesake to Wales. They're raising money to go to Wales. They have sacrifice to go to a foreign land with the gospel. However, will we sacrifice to get them there for his name's sake? It's not about us, not about them. It's for his name's sake. Guess is a great example for us to follow because he cared for these traveling missionaries. Former pastor of the great Moody Church, Harry Ironside, once said, 
No sacrifice should be too great for him who gave himself for us. And he's absolutely right. During the reign of Frederick William III, King of Prussia, he found himself in great trouble. He was carrying on expensive wars and he was endeavoring to strengthen his country and make a great name for Prussia. However, the only problem was is that he didn't have enough money to accomplish his plans. And uh, he couldn't disappoint the, the people. And um, to capitulate to the enemy is unthinkable. And so he thought about it for quite a while and he decided to approach the women of Prussia and ask them to give their jewelry of gold and silver and that they would melt it down and, and that it would be money for their country. Well, that's what they did. And uh, the, the king resolved that what he would do for each ornament of gold or silver that he would give in exchange a dec uh, decoration of bronze, uh, a token of gratitude. And each bronze uh, decoration would bear the inscription, I gave gold for iron, 1813. Wouldn't you like to get your hand on one of those? You know, look it up. Maybe there's one somewhere around. But... Uh, the response of the women in this story was overwhelming. And uh, what was even more amazing was the fact that the women prized these gifts that were given to them by the king more than they did their gold and silver, which was worth more. Uh, but these women prized this more. The, the bronze declarations were proof uh, to each lady that she had given her best to the king. That's the way they thought of it. She had given her best to the king. And you know, I, I, I can't think of anything better to say about that than to repeat, repeat what missionary David Livingston said. He said, if a commission by an earthly king is considered an honor, how can a commission by a heavenly king be, can be considered a sacrifice? What a powerful statement. Gaius knew the commission given by Jesus to go into all the world, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is the commission that Jesus gave. And I'll tell you what, Gaius participated all for his name. That's why he did it. And then last of all, we find Gaius partnered all for his name. Verse 8, And therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. Now John is making it known that these missionaries who have gone out from the church, they've gone out under the banner of Jesus Christ. They had not gone out in, under their own name. They didn't go in their own name. They didn't go out to make a name for themselves. They had gone out to make much of the name of Jesus. That's what they were doing. That was their desire. No, they were not prophet, uh, peddlers of profit. Uh, they were men who needed help financially, these that were traveling missionaries. And so they could pro proclaim they needed support, they needed help, so they could proclaim the message they believed, namely the gospel. That's what they were doing. These missionaries that we've had with us over the last couple of weeks, hear me when I tell you that they're not asking money for themselves. That's not what it's all about. You say, well, it must be nice. Everybody just gives you money wherever you go. I promise you, the missionaries that we have here this morning, you saw on the video, Kevin was a real estate man after he got through with Bible college for almost 20 years and made really well in real estate. Uh, and he left all that to be a missionary, to not make a name for himself, to not make money for himself, but to go and give the gospel for his namesake. That's why they've gone. It's not so that they can, they're asking money for themselves. They're asking you to support them to take the good news that Jesus says to those who are lost in their sins. We have a world that's lost and dying and going to hell and they need somebody to tell them of the love of Jesus Christ. That's what these missionaries are doing. They are going all for his name. Not all of us are called to go to some foreign land. 
but all of us are called to send others. Now, not all of us are called to preach, but we all must provide to get those there so they can give the gospel message. This is a joint participation, a partnership that I'm talking about, so that others may come to know the truth, that they too can know Jesus Christ, and that they too can walk in truth, just like this man Gaius. What a wonderful privilege, all for his name. Thank God for that privilege. Missionary David Livingston said, People talk of sacrifice I've made in spending so much of my life in Africa. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather, it is a privilege. And it is. And you may sacrifice some things. You know, here in America, what you may sacrifice a a coffee, a cup of coffee uh, once a week or once a day or something like that in order to give to missions. Things have become so uh, expensive. You can imagine. I read somewhere one time that people spend more on dog food than they do sending missionaries to foreign countries. And it's true. It's absolutely true. It shows you where our priorities are in this world. I read one of our missionary um, prayer letters. Uh, feel free, out in our mission cafe here, we have a book that has the printed form of all of our mission missionary letters. And also, if you want to go to the screen, you mash on the screen, and it'll uh, pull up different parts of the world. You want to read their prayer letter, uh, you go to that, and the prayer letter will be there. And so I encourage you to do so. I read one that came in this week from our missionaries in Tanzania, and God had blessed them, uh, has blessed them with churches there. Uh, the Smiths have been there for many years. We have supported them, and... Uh, uh, the churches have started, and now they're excited. They're starting a Bible college there in Tanzania. Uh, it's where uh, Joanne Fultz has just come from. And uh, uh, so, uh, but I read in this letter, and I got real excited when I got down to the last part. And uh, what a great quote that Vernon said. He said, we can do what we do if you didn't do what you do. That's a good quote. I like that. We can do what we do if you didn't do what you do. What are they doing? They're starting churches. They're winning people to Christ. They're building a new Bible college now to reach that country for Christ. What do we do? We give, we pray, we send, and we anxiously wait to hear of the souls that have come to Christ as a result of them going. That's what it's all about. Our own missionary, David Homer, is sitting here, and he and Wendy will be leaving us uh, at this week sometime, uh, perhaps, probably. And uh, But he told in his letter uh, of how um, 40 years, I, I loved your letter, David, and we're, we're going to read it to our church, but uh, 40 years of, of ministry uh, starting churches in four different countries, um, which, praise God, because of churches like this one that, that give. They're retiring from church planning, but not from ministry. They'll continue to go on and do the work of the Lord. But I love what you put down the last of the letter there, David. It said, we, we would love to thank you for holding the rope for us. That's powerful. We're here at home holding the rope. That's what mission's all about. That's what partnership, all for his name, is all about. Holding the rope here back home because we're giving, we're praying so that they may go and start these churches in four different countries. One of my favorite missionary stories, I've told this story all over America in preaching and mission conferences, but there was a young man in Arkansas who had surrendered his life to be a missionary to the to the backwood tribes in New Guinea. This is many years ago. I don't know, 75, 100 years ago. But everyone questioned his calling uh, to to New Guinea, and the reason why is because the young man had a cleft palate and a cleft lip, and back in that day and time, they didn't have the surgery to know what to do like they do today, and uh, not many people could understand what the young man was saying. No mission board would take him on, and uh, finally, out of sympathy, his home church agreed that they would give him $90 a month, saying that that's all that they could do. Well, the young man had a sister who had never married, and uh, she worked for the railroad as a telegrapher, 
And she said to her brother one day, if God has called you to go to New Guinea, I'm going to give you my entire paycheck every month so you can go. Her father heard her say that. They were good church people there in the church. Her father heard her say that, and he was so moved with compassion for his son going and that his daughter wanted to help her brother get to the field. He said, if you're willing to do that for your brother and for my son, you can move into my house and I will feed you, I will clothe you, I will give you everything you need to live. And the boy went on to New Guinea. They went to a tribe of people who had never seen a white man before and he gave them the gospel of Jesus. As far as they knew, every white man had a cleft palate and a cleft lip and that every white man spoke that way. And so after learning the language, of course, he gave them the gospel of Jesus. Several years later, Wycliffe translators, Bible translators, came into that part of the world, and they were going to transcribe or um, translate their language into written form so that people could have a Bible. And as they entered into that region, they began noticing uh, several little buildings that had a cross on top of it. And they thought, whoa, you know, we're out here in this primitive area and they have this. And uh, finally, they found church after church like this. And finally, when they could communicate with someone, they asked them, how do you have all these churches? And they finally communicated back to them. A man from Arkansas, USA, came and told us about Jesus. Friend, I ask you today, which one of those was the true missionary? Was it the young man that, you know, in spite of his difficulties that he went and he gave the gospel message? Or was it her, his sister who gave her entire paycheck so that he could go? Or was it the dad who cared for the daughter so she could give? They all partnered together. All of them. Why? All for his name. He's worthy. We need to get the gospel. Third John, in third John, John expressed about supporting those who teach and preach the word of God. And I say to you, friend, God has placed us at a critical moment in human history. You think about it, the voices of all the great leaders of the past seem to be silent. Many of them have passed off the scene. Of the great crusades that you do not hear about much anymore, of hundreds and thousands of people coming to Christ, I would tell you that this world is in desperate need of Jesus Christ. We're losing our beloved country. I'd say it's probably already gone. It's a sad thing that we witness. And you know, with knowing that they, that the world needs Jesus Christ and that this country would change if they knew the Lord, I'm telling you. I saw the other day someone sent me, which was alarming to me, one of the great churches, um, I would say 50, 75 years ago, the Temple Baptist Church in Detroit, great ministry, maybe the largest church in America back in those days, Dr. Beechamvik was one of the founding leaders of the Baptist Bible Fellowship, was president of Baptist Bible College for many years. That church, they moved out of that building. And um, from my understanding, the church is still going. It's not by that name. But today, there is a Muslim mosque in that building. They have bought that building. They own that huge auditorium now that I have been in many times. Folks, our world's in need of Jesus Christ. America's falling out, falling apart. Now you might, you might, you might think to yourself, what I can do is so insignificant compared to the needs of the world that, that what good, do, what I do, that little bit that I do, what good will it do? Friend, all of us together, there are missionaries around the world that are preaching the gospel today because of p- churches like this one and people like you that have been willing to sacrifice and give for missions. 
Do what you can. Friend, our motto is loving God, loving others, and making a difference. That's what our church wants to do. You might feel like you're the only one. You might be the only one. But I like that song that Squire Parsons wrote, and he sang in our church many times, that said, one voice crying in the wilderness, one voice proclaiming righteousness, one man doing what he's called to do, one man faithful and true. Friend, if nobody else does anything, we're going to do something for God, amen? And that was Gaius here, one man that stood up, even in opposition, he did for God, and you and I have the golden opportunity to make a difference even if we are one. If God has called you to go, go. He will enable you to go. And if God has not called you to go, He will enable you to sin. We're asking you today, would you make a commitment on your commitment cards for the coming year? I'm going to do this to get the gospel to the far regions of the world. Would you do that? Would you give to the Lord? Make that commitment this year. I'm praying that our church will step up. We do great things for missions. We have six missionary families out of our church, and we support a host of others that have gone out into the world. We support a lot of local ministries here of trying to help in our community and be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have a part of that. I'm glad I'm a part of it. I'm glad I'm investing eternally. How about you, friend? I'd be amiss today to preach about getting the gospel to the world and not tell you today, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, my friend, the Bible says all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Everybody needs the Lord, but God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And all we have to do is repent of our sins and whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you come to him today and call upon him as your Lord and Savior?